Pario Scorpio was described last year as the earliest scorpion to have been found in the fossil record. But that may not actually be the case, at least according to one new paper. Pario Scorpio was found in the Silurian Wakusha Lagerstein of Wisconsin, which is not somewhere you normally think of as having really cool fossils, but the authors do get into this a little bit and how there's a lot of Lagerstein like this that need to be studied more. But right now, their main focus is on whether or not it was actually a scorpion, and they found that it really wasn't. Now, even before Peri Scorpio was found and called a scorpion, it had been thought to belong to a number of different groups because people knew about the fossil but didn't really look at it in that great of detail. Some of these include a remipede or branchiopod crustacean in 1985, a chelonid, which is really closely related to trilobites in 2014, or a scorpion in the paper that it was named in in 2020. Now that's just a really quick summary of a number of other papers that had different names for it based on more incomplete remains, but this newest paper finds the 2020 paper to be the most complete description of what it might actually be for being recognizable, because that paper dealt with the most complete remains of it up until that point. And it's really important that I say up until that point, because this new paper also found a number of new fossils of Peria Scorpio, and we're able to re-diagnose it and re-describe it in greater detail. I will be getting into some of these other features later on, but first we're going to look at just what happened when they put it into a phylogeny. So essentially they rank characteristics it has, like how many eyes it has, where are those eyes, and put it into a complex matrix and statistical program, and then run it through the computer and see where it ends up. And it ends up here. Now there's a lot of names on this, and for what they mean, at the bottom are animals that aren't arthropods. So they're not animals with an exoskeleton and, importantly, jointed appendages. So this includes animals like Opabinia, tardigrades, and hallucigenia, which is probably more closely related to the velvet worms. However, closer to Peria Scorpio and the arthropods are the radiodonts, megacarids, and then way, way up high are the chelicerates, which does include the scorpions. Now, all of the arthropod groups are actually named with the little bars on the side, and some of these are a little weird, like calling Opabinia not an arthropod, but all the radiodonts as arthropods, despite them both coming to the same node at the base of the tree. But that's okay, because that's not the focus of this study, and there are other papers that have looked more closely at those relationships. This is just for a broader understanding of where Peria Scorpio may fit in a larger arthropod clade. But as that image showed, Peria Scorpio is probably not a scorpion. In fact, as far as we can tell, it's not really much of an anything right now, and that's because it groups entirely on its own. Truly, one is the loneliest number for it. It, it is all by itself. It did walk or swim alone. So it really doesn't have a lot of relationships that we can test directly based just on this phylogeny. So the researchers took another step. Rather than just ranking characteristics and running it through the computer, the researchers looked at the fossils of Peria Scorpio and fossils of other animals that would have been around at around the same time and probably somewhat closely related to it, and looked for specific details and features that they would have had in common. But unfortunately, that didn't really help narrow it down either, because it still had a hodgepodge of features. For example, with animals like Fuxian Huia, it had a distinct lack of an eye ridge that is present in a lot of the other early arthropods. But then like animals like Tokumia, all the limbs on the head were distinctly designed not to help it walk. It also had bristles on the branches of some of the limbs, like Agnostis does. But that's only a small selection of the features it shares with other animals. And again, like I said, it's very much a hodgepodge. Its features are very spread out across the early arthropod family tree. So even trying to look for very specific characteristics, they couldn't find anything that really helps us to narrow down where exactly Peria Scorpio is on the arthropod family tree. But they did run it through that phylogeny that I mentioned earlier again, and it didn't come out in quite the same place. This phylogeny didn't use quite the same system as the previous one, and that's because of two different potential interpretations of the fossils of Peria Scorpio. It had large, great appendages at the front of the head, and this is the technical term for them. In animals like Anomalocaris, they're the large grasping arms at the front. In fact, the group Anomalocaris belongs to, the radiodonts, have been called the great appendage arthropods before this. However, as we found more fossils, it does seem like a lot of the early arthropods actually have these appendages, so it's really not the best name for that group anymore. Regardless though, with Peria Scorpio, the major thing that we need to understand is how they attach to the body, and there's essentially two hypotheses that these authors look at. They prefer the first, where the arms attach to the head and essentially have a very specific muscle system in the head that helps to power them. The other option is that they attach further down onto the body with long bars that come out and then the arms come out from the sides. 
this kind of second interpretation is more like what we see in the Fuchs and Weeds. So it is something that is possible, and that's what was tested in this second phylogeny. And what they found is actually it still doesn't group with the Fuchs and Weeds. It's very, very close, but it doesn't branch off of the same branch as them. Instead, it's kind of indeterminate where exactly it is. So this means we probably need more fossils of Periascorpio or another closely related animal to get a better idea of where exactly it came from. And as for that interpretation of the arms, as I said, the authors prefer the first interpretation, which would make them, again, more distinct than the other groups. However, they do leave that caveat of, hey, we haven't actually found a lot of fossils from this formation, so we could find more still. And additionally, there's other Lagerstaten that have been found from around this time period that haven't been thoroughly studied. Although in the last few years, they have started to show more interest in these kinds of time periods and these fossils. So there is still a chance that in the next few years, we may find a new type of Puri Scorpio relative that can help us understand how exactly the arthropods started to evolve. Although it is very unfortunate that Puri Scorpio was named Puri Scorpio when it is demonstrably not a scorpion.